thank you so much for being here this afternoon. So this is the first time we are doing a panel of this sort at Facelift. Hey, I'm Allison, you probably know, I've been helping with the Yosemite yeah. Climbing Association. Yes. And Woo -woo. thank you. <laughs> to my left, I have Chris Schulte, who's a black diamond athlete. He started climbing in Colorado in 1994 and he is motivated in climbing by the setting and getting to great places. Some of his career highlights include a V15, the Big Island, and Fontainebleau. Also the second ascent of Partage Assis, which is a V13 in Font as well, and FAs of the right and the one percenter, which are V14s in Colorado. He also has some high balls in Indian Creek. <laughs> So to his left, I have Katie Goodwin with the Access Fund. She is the Northern California director and also policy analyst. She's been working in public land management for over a decade. Thank you for being here. Kate Rutherford to her left is a black diamond athlete and a Patagonia ambassador. She grew up in rural Alaska, apparently with a trapeze in her home, <laughs> uh, which gave her a lot of opportunity to practice being in high places. She started climbing in Colorado in college, and she's motivated by uh, climbing long uh, systems of craft. She has uh, notable ascents in Yosemite, including a free ascent of Free Rider, um, as well as the northwest face of Half Dome. Um, she also has a free ascent of Moonlight Buttress and has done a first ascent of a, a route called 10 Pounds of Tequila in Venezuela. Yeah. which is a grade six, five, 12 plus route. So impressive. Thanks for being here. Apparently she also climbed Fitzroy with the flu. <laughs> Maybe we'll hear a little bit more about that today. Uh, <laughs> also a jeweler, you might know her, her uh, suspended stone design. Jeff Lotus is a trainer with Warrior's Way for California, Oregon, and Washington, and he hails from Santa Barbara, has been climbing for 15 years. The Warrior's Way uh, is, was originally a book by Arno Ilgner and uh, is around the concepts of mental training for climbing. So thank you all for being here, really. I really Yay. appreciate this, and thank you also <laughs> to the beginning. So the purpose of this talk is to explore concepts of attention and how we can, through, through exploring concepts of attention, improve our climbing performance, but also uh, identify new stewardship issues that might need our attention. Um, if we go back to the beginning of Facelift, uh, Facelift started in 2004, a lot of you know the history, but if it weren't for Ken Yeager's attention to an issue of trash around the valley and his embarrassment as a climbing guide in Yosemite Valley, bringing clients through trash, uh, he would not have decided to put together a facelift, which he thought was a better use of his energy rather than being angry about the problem of litter in Yosemite. So he sets a model for us because he was proactive in identifying an issue that required a resolution um, which is something that I think if we shift our attention towards stewardship issues, we could probably proactively identify new issues uh, in climbing areas that require attention. So I want to start with a question from each of our panelists, um, going back to their beginning or to the mission of their organizations. You know, what, it, what is a tip that they would give a beginner climber? How long has everybody been climbing? Who's the newest climber here? How do we know that? Do you know that? I don't know who what? thinks yeah. that there's what's, a what's the year? climber here. I probably do. Nice. Mm -hmm. How long so have you been climbing? Five years. Yeah? A <laughs> year and a half. Sorry. Yeah, a year and a half. So. Nice. They win. <laughs> you, uh... <laughs> nice. Um, keep doing it, basically. Um, what I've kind of found out over time was that uh, the longer I did it, uh, it, it really changed for me exactly what I was... Uh, what I was looking for, what I was getting out of it. Um, I knew pretty much right away that this is what I'm going to do. This is my way. You know, it's my you. Know, it's my whatever. It's, 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 it's my thing. And um, it's, it's grown with me over time, you know, to the point to where um, it's, it's something I do like eating or whatever. It's, it's part of my life and it's been with me since I was 
15 or something, you know, I'm 41 now. Um, if you stick with it, it's you're gonna you're gonna find a whole lot. It's gonna build. It's gonna pair away, and it, it, it's really gonna change for you. You know, um, if, if you decide to stick with it, because you do, you have to, you have to put a lot into it. Um, but at the same time, the other side of that coin is if you, if you just keep doing it, you, you get better and you enjoy it more. Sort of as a side effect. Yeah, so I work with Access Fund and. If you're not familiar, we our main mission is to protect and preserve the climbing environment. And so I work nationally on policy issues that might impact our ability to go and climb in amazing places like here in Yosemite or some random place out in the middle of the forest. Um, and so one thing to think about when you're starting a transition or just becoming a new climber is it's just like going for a hike or anything else. You need to think about where you're going and are there rules for that area like Yosemite it's probably you really can't bring a dog um, they have seasonal raptor closures so just like thinking ahead of where you're going and be prepared to make sure you're not um, having a negative impact on access by maybe just making a mistake you didn't know about and there's a lot of good resources usually online if you just google like mountain project or something my biggest tip um, for beginners, I think, is to make your partners laugh. I think having fun <laughs> is so important to the well-being of the planet and just your day. You know, you're gonna um, you're gonna just have more fun if you don't take yourself too seriously. You don't take the objective too seriously, and you make sure to really enter into it with a lot of joy and fun. And and really appreciation for your partners because they help make you fun and keep you safe. I would say uh, start working with mental training earlier than you think because it's one of the most challenging things to do as a climber. You know, among skill training and uh, physical training and mental training, mental training is probably the longest term challenge. <laughs> so, um, you know. Start leading right away and, and look at your mental game right away. What are the foundations of mental training that, with a new client, kind of the basics that you that you start exploring? Yeah, um, typically uh, for a beginner, the, like who hasn't doesn't do a lot of sport climbing, for example, or push themselves regularly, as a more advanced climber would. Um, the issue is falling um, and. You know they're afraid of being hurt because they don't know how to fall, um, and that limits their ability to to think um, <laughs> and to move. Um, so, what are some aspects of mental training that help you get over that fear of falling? Right. Um, so, to you know, you kind of shift your relationship with fear. So, actually, like you don't want to get over your fear of falling. Like you want to listen to that fear. <laughs> Because it's telling you something. It's telling you that you're about to do something that you're not capable of doing safely. So, in order to listen to the fear, you then get some falling practice. You do some training. Figure out how what those techniques look like in a controlled environment. Um, and you know, I will say, like as the climber gets better and deals with the fear of falling, for example, a new obstacle comes up to performance. And like the process of becoming a pro athlete, in a sense, is like paring away all the things that prevent you from being your best client, you know, and maybe for someone who's got like all that, the skills and following and, and that sort of wired down, it becomes like more psychological, you know, more subtle layers of stuff starts to come out. So we, we started working with elite athletes and I discovered that they also have you know, challenges, basically. even though they're not the same ones that beginners have, they, they take the same form in the mind, like kind of limiting it's like in cycles, I can I can totally agree with that. Even like um, I've been climbing for 22 years or so, and I still go through periods where like I'm terrified of falling every six months or something like that. I'm mostly a boulder, and I would most of the time rather take a 20 foot grounder than like a 10 foot fall. You know, because because I, I I know what it's like and I'm accustomed to it, and that's what I do more of. But then you know you do the other things and so on. But, yeah, and that's just the falling aspect. Like, um, I've, I've said to myself, I've learned to try hard. 
I don't know how many times now. Like, it took me years until I was like, ah, okay, this is what it is to try hard while I'm working on whatever project. Like, ah, okay, that's, that is, that's how you're, you're all integrated, you're trying, you're, you're, you're genuinely trying, everything's working properly, your motivation's right, that's what it is. And then a couple of years go by and you're like, no, no, this is what it is. So yeah, it's kind of a waste of refining. There's an evolution. You, Jeff, you had mentioned attention, the idea of attention as being critical to mental training. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yes. Um, so, um, attention is what you can control while you're on a climb, essentially. You know, your movements, your um, your actions, your what you look at um, in terms of your protection systems or where you're going, but like the kind of the fundamental currency of the mind is attention. Um, what we place it on and the quality of it sort of determines how effective we are in, in the situation that we're in. If it's a stressful situation, like a hard onslaught or something, we really have to have full control of our attention to be able to keep it off of ineffective um, thought processes and keep it exactly where it needs to be, which is in the moment and on the task. So, you know, that's why climbing, I look at climbing as like a laboratory. So it's a laboratory for learning to effectively use the mind and um, to, to partner the body to the mind in a more harmonious way. A lot of people have a lot of separation between the mind and the mind is telling them one thing and their body's struggling against it and it's this conflict that produces, yeah, not an effective result. So by being more attentive and noticing what's going on on a more detailed level in the moment, then you achieve that, you know, safety, uh, performance, um, and you have more fun, honestly, you're not fighting yourself or afraid. <laughs> can, can you, in your climbing experience, think of a time when some of these thought concepts about attention have helped get you through, or some challenge where you really had to pull yourself together, or were able to do it, and what it felt like? Right, well, like, Chris was saying, FFA, <laughs> it's right, um, wasn't what I was going to say, but it's great. I mean, I, um, I have this little video clip, which is why Chris could tell I had the flu, and I have lost my voice. And we're only like a third of the way into this giant first ascent attempt on Fitzroy, which I had never actually gotten to the top of, even after like five years of trying. And so here I am talking to the camera, and... I basically, I have laryngitis and I feel okay, but it sounds really terrible. And we've already been thwarted basically. This Vivi, was, we, were, we didn't bring sleeping bag. Um, and <laughs> we ended up spending two nights. And this first, I can't talk and I'm telling everybody how I've like gotten to this point after a whole day of climbing and we're like not even face. <laughs> and so anyway, the second day was epic. You know, sans sleeping bag, sick. Um, and I don't ice climb very much, but I love Patagonia. And so my partner, Mike Schaefer, was like, okay, I'll lead all the ice climbing, you lead all the rock climbing. Okay. So then day two is all the rock climbing, it turns out. And, um, you know, in places like that, sure, we had the binoculars out, we've been studying photos, like we really had a theory that this would go, this weakness would go, but you just, are questing out up there and I remember getting to this really beautiful part of the climb pretty high um, maybe five pitches from the sort of summit ridge and there was this off width and then there was this giant horizontal off width that you could like get into basically so I was got my legs shoved in there and I'm looking up and I don't have any more big camps like I probably only had a four to start with and um <laughs> I'm like totally stuck on this off with ledge, you know, but I'm kind of like crammed in there and I'm looking up and I just like, I was really scared to venture into the unknown because it was wide, like first far as I could see, you know, but, and eventually I could see another ledge, but like, it was like pretty splitter, like five Camelots and I didn't have one and you know, who knows where the floor was, but yeah, I was like, well, here we are, like way up here this is like my dream our dream to climb this mountain and you know do I just stop now or do I at least set off into the unknown and try and what are the consequences and 
I sat there for a long time and it was so beautiful this like perfect granite like angles and cracks and you know I was like well there we go and just whatever started starting and it I was like okay well I won't do anything I can't come down from just anyway I eat my way to the next ledge and that was like kind of the least of our worries and then it just like got <laughs> harder basically but like there was this you know moment where I was like I really don't know and so that's one of the hardest things for me like being able to step into the unknown physically like can I physically know that I can do this or like does it even go you know does it just dead end so it's it's hard we do it all the time that's like what I mean so just getting comfortable with that it sounds, it sounds, step. yeah, so, thank you. It sounds like one of the keys there was that idea of, well, I'm not going to do anything I can't come down from. Right. And it's almost like having trust in that thought, putting your focus on that was the thing that, like, one of, the, <laughs> one of the ways that you were able to move through it. And then there are times when I have tried as hard as I possibly could because it wasn't safe. And that was really powerful. And it worked. <laughs> and... <laughs> There were probably times I actually could fall, and it was, I'm still here. <laughs> but um, but that is a really, fear is a very powerful motivator sometimes, mm -hmm. too. So, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm like the office, I like should not be on this panel. I'm such a bad warrior. Like, I'm so <laughs> scared all the time. <laughs> I'm a bad warrior, too. I think we can all agree that, um, we, you know. How's, how is the partner dynamic? You're sitting there, it's not just you, it's your partner, too. They're so. like way down there. Nope. No, but I do think that is a really huge thing, and to be supportive of your partner, mm -hmm. whether it's like, yeah, you got this, even though they might not, or like, hey, if you don't want to go up there, you can come down, and I will still love you, or whatever, you know, or like, I'll try, <laughs> or, you know, so we can like, share in this like, really hard experience, it's not just like, sending them off to the wolves, you know, you try to be there, even if they can't hear you, you know, be, making sure they feel like they have your support. Can I ask a question? Yeah. So, like, thinking of the partner dynamics, particularly as someone who often climbs with a romantic partner, which I've told, I'm like, maybe don't start climbing that way. <laughs> um, like, that attention to fear, like, thinking about how do you take that fear and pivot into something that's powerful for yourself is one thing, right? But then when you see your partner scared or you can sense, like, maybe, like, your lingering fear, your, maybe your lurking fear is like seeping into their mindset like what can like what advice would you give to like thinking about like how do you it's not like you can make someone be positive or happy or like go have fun but like when you especially if you're on something whether it's like your first multi pitch or like something big and long are you, like you're talking like about influencing someone else's correct and shifting yeah. someone else's mindset yeah exactly i think being silly and just ridiculously positive goes a long way. Okay, because yeah. Like start singing bad Madonna, <laughs> I don't know, you know, whatever it is that you think is gonna like lighten the spirits, like it's yeah. super valuable. Yeah. And then they're gonna have to do it for you at some point too. So it's great to like be able to receive that too and be like, okay, they're trying to be uplifting, I'm gonna appreciate that and Yeah. You know, just think that that might be a way you wanna yeah. get your emotions to go. Uh, I usually act like an idiot when I climb. Like, it's hard. Safe, but idiotic. Yeah. Idiotic is perfect. <laughs> Something that stood out in, in your dialogue just a second ago to me was that you were kind of stuck in there looking up at this thing. And it was like you were there for a moment. And you sort of chip stop in the situation. And it, to me, I sort of heard that you were there long enough and took in the situation that you were like, it's sort of came to terms and sort of were at peace with it. You're like, here I am. This is kind of nice. This could be worse. And that was a kind of a, a powerful thing. And for me, like, especially when, when climbing with significant other, uh, that, that goes a long ways. Because, like, again, I'm, I'm mostly a boulder. You know, I started out not as a boulder and then sort of pared it down. And I've been mostly a boulder for over a decade. Um, so now I've been lately in the last year and change coming back to route climbing 
and our fidgety widgets are jingling all over the place and they're in my way and I'm banging my head with the helmet that's too hot to wear and I got all this garbage, you know, and sometimes it's frustrating, you know, it's crazy frustrating. But my partner is like, here we are and we're doing this and okay, well, just here, this is what's happening and this mm. is what it is and you know, and it helps to like, to hear that and to look around and, and, and think like, yeah, okay, this, yeah, you Take a moment. Mm. Thanks for being here. I appreciate that. You know, um, yeah. yesterday I just I was thrashing around yesterday, just pissed. <laughs> you know, like I'm stuck in a crack that I don't want to be inside. It's eating me alive. <laughs> All the garbage I need to save my life on this five nine, I should be able to solo anytime. It's <laughs> like really hindering me. Yeah. And I just got top this pitch shot, and I was like, ah, you know. And here she come. She's like. Yeah, it is what it is. I promise the rest is good. And it was freaking amazing from then on, you know? We're just sailing up these awesome, I love squeezing things, and here's these parallel railroad track cracks, and I'm just having the best time of my life. Mm. And, yeah, it's, it's good to have that person there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and here. <laughs> I want, I'm going to shift gears a little bit, because I want to try to bring it back to some stewardship concepts. But maybe we can get into that by the idea of really being present in your environment. So I think part of what we discussed before we all met here was the idea that as a climber, it's almost impossible not to connect with your environment. And a couple of the things, Chris, that you said and Kate, you said, it sounded like you were able at, at some moments to kind of really be present in your environment, kind of helped guide you through that, almost had an encouraging element to it. So I don't know if anything about that triggers a connection or or some description that you could give about how you feel climbing has helped you be connected to the environment that you climb in. A minute ago you said something about um, focusing your attention. And I love the word attention. Uh, and, you know, anybody ever heard of Alan Watts? Yeah. yeah, he's a hoot. He's outstanding, you know. I mean, I, I didn't really dig him for a long time because I like the old stuff, you know, when I started listening to this guy and he's hilarious, but one of the things he talks about is attention with the uh, there's like the, the spotlight and the flashlight, the beat and all that. And um, so often when you're climbing, especially when you're trying to do the thing, you're right here all the time and you get locked into right there and it can be frustrating, you know, and then sitting back every now and again and remembering where you were this is probably why you started, you know, this is why I started. I didn't start climbing because I wanted to grab some horrible little hole to swing around and split a tip and not be able to climb for a week. You know, I wanted to get up on that ledge with that tree and hang out. You know, it's cool. It's, it, I wanted to be in this place and what, what a thing to do in that space. Yeah. I think also that attention to detail, you know, you're face is like an inch from the wall and you're like looking for these little crystals you might stand on and then there's this like hot green lichen and you're like that you know and then you're like oh look and then there's like some moths over here and you know you, you go from that spotlight and it just like gets bigger and bigger and you're like oh man there's a fern growing out of the moss and oh look there's like a little flower garden over here which is great when you're scared you can be like totally distracted yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna focus on this um, and and then just like it's just like a neat progression. You're like, okay, this lichen makes soil for this moss. And it's like, you know, the whole thing is this like integrated ecosystem. And so, and being able to see that diversity when you're, you know, it all started because you're looking for a crystal that was far away. And then you're like, oh wow, like this whole ecosystem cares about this little crystal I want to stand on too. You know, it's like such a, it's an amazing way to feel like you're part of that ecosystem and also that you're impacting it. Like, yeah, I'm going to squish the shit out of that lichen when I stand on it. <laughs> you know, it may or may not die. Um, so anyway, it's real. we are impactful, you know, and climbing is really selfish and personal and I spend all of my energy on this thing that nobody cares about except for me, basically. <laughs> and so, and I don't know how else to use that passion but to 
try to save this landscape that I'm interacting with. And so I think it is really important for climbers to be stewards and to take their passion and illuminate these landscapes for other people and drive the message home that it really matters if we save this planet because otherwise they're, you know, they're just going to build a gondola to the top of El Cap and you won't even have to climb up there anymore and then where are we going to be? <laughs> so, <laughs> and then the lift will stop running and then we'll have to go back to climbing again. But anyway, I think it's, it is a good soapbox. You know, whether you just started climbing or whether you've been climbing your whole life, to remind yourself and everybody else that stewardship is pivotal and, and actually makes a difference. So. Katie, I want to ask you a little bit about the Jim DeCrag program and like what a few of the lessons are that you would love every beginner climber to know about their impact when they move into the outdoors. Yeah, yeah. So you know, in a lot of ways, um, I feel like it's like, oh, it's the gym climbers. Like, gym climbers get a bad rap, right? Like, it's easy to pin impacts on the new kid on the block. And so, our strategy and um, educational messaging, we're trying to move away from that because everybody's welcome in this community and we're all part of the system when we're out here climbing, just like Kate said. And we all just need to be mindful stewards. So, what we've done, we've through various iterations, including Chris used to be part of this. Um, we go into gyms and often it'll be just like an informal panel like this or we'll host a clinic with a professional athlete. Um, and is everyone familiar with like Leave No Trace ethics? So we have been working with Leave No Trace and kind of tailoring some of that messaging a little more specific to climbing related impacts. Um, and I think the most important things to think about is you know, what are your general experiences being outdoors? In some situations, I go a lot to urban centers, and it could be that someone's been gym climbing for two years, they live in the bay, they've never really gone climbing outside, and they come to Yosemite for the first time. And so, it's just thinking about things like, well, what happens when I need to go to the bathroom? There's not a, there's probably not, you know, a gym bathroom right there. So, things like that. Um, you know, what should I be bringing to be prepared? And then also just learning things like figuring out the information, staying on trail is a big one. We talk about um, the basics, packing out your trash. Those are some of the bigger visual impacts that can create, um, frankly, access issues. But beyond that, you're not really taking care of this new landscape that you're part of. So that's kind of, um, yeah, the system we've been running through. And, putting that out in various messaging systems um, and just trying to make it a more inclusive thing like I don't think it's fair to pin impacts on one group of people um, <laughs> you know I hear the word gumbies being thrown around things like that um, and I'll put it out there there's a lot of old climbers who've been around for a long time who do some really naughty things too so <laughs> we want that messaging to be out there and just aware you're not the only person in this landscape and um, you should just take care of it and, and leave it as it was to share with the next people that come through or animals or lichen or whatever happens to be there. Yeah. Thanks. I think, I think as people who have been climbing longer, we tend to forget maybe that we need to be taught to pay attention to certain impacts. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, a lot of what I know about climbing I've learned from my mentors. And those are the impacts I'm looking at. The ethics that I've adopted are the ones I've been told to adopt. But sometimes I think I maybe ignore or neglect other impacts because I haven't necessarily been told to pay attention yeah. to them. And as climbing gets more popular and there's more and more climbers, I feel it's going to be more and more important to be like Ken when he identified that litter issue and was proactive and kind of changing the Yosemite ethics and norms around trash in Yosemite. Uh, and that was that he kind of identified that and then came up with a solution without really being told to do that. So inventing a solution because your attention shifts from what you've been told to look at to kind of finding new things to tell other people to look at. So how can we, you know, do you have any ideas about taking it a step further 
and being kind of proactive about our collective impact. I can jump in again really quick. I'll let you guys go. But you know, one, when I started working for Access Fund, I'd been a climber for quite some time and spent a lot of time in both, you know, really popular climbing areas and more backcountry environments. And one thing I never really thought about is just like to pick a specific issue that we see in more popular areas is the outward spread from the base of a crag or a boulder. Mm -hmm. So at a gym, you go in and you put all your stuff in a cubby well away from the wall. And it's kind of intuitive when you get to a wall, you want your stuff out of the way. So I'm gonna go sit back in this tree, maybe knock down some grass and some bushes. And if everybody keeps doing that, the impacted area around the base of the climbs start spreading, there's erosion issues and that sort of thing. Um, and it's like, you know, we try and message, like actually keep your stuff, you know, at the base of the wall, like stage everything closely. But um, you know how to, that's just like a, a general example of something to like think about. Like you may go to an area that no one's really climbing and, and it's easy to think, I'm the only one here. I'm gonna go sit on this log back here and, and hang out. But um, just being like really mindful specifically in areas that aren't heavily impacted yet and think about what would this look like if me and a hundred people did what I'm doing right now. Um, yeah. So this is perfect. I have a, a climbing friend that's identified a problem at the at the base of Medlicott Dome and um, going up to the base um, the meadows are getting trashed and they would like to have an alternate route so the meadow can be restored, but how, how can a per person start with that project? Yep, so um, in that specific case, I would talk with Yosemite Conservancy and okay. Access Fund. I mean, that's a lot of what we do, but is trying who to get- would? Who would? So you would contact us directly okay. and bring up the issue. Um, and typically, we do a lot of that trail work. We have three teams that are travel the country year round doing that and lots of times we create visual cues redirect trails to you know yeah, yeah. mitigate that yeah. resource management yeah. um, and certainly it's kind of a never-ending thing but when you start seeing those issues bring it whoever manages that area whoever the local stewards are those are good places to start um, access fund is always a good resource because that's what we're here for it's our bread and butter is okay. we're doing trail work and trying to preserve the landscape. So. Cool. Yeah. Chris, Katie, or Jeff, do you have any, any idea, thoughts about collective impact? And sure. I mean, what do you guys think our largest collective impact is as humans? Driving. Like in the next, in the next 50 years, what, what's going to be the problem? Water. Yeah. yeah. Soil, water, climate change. Yeah. So a little bit of erosion in Medlicott is like, is important, but what if the whole meadow turns to a desert? Like, I think part of like climbing is like objectively assessing what you're about to get yourself into. Right? If you look up at a at a climb, you're like, well, I don't have any level fives, but I have some off skills. So I'm gonna go up there and just see how this feels. You know? And if it's too hard, I'm down. Like, and you're honest with yourself. You're not like, oh yeah, I got all kinds of number fives on. It's gonna be fine. Like. <laughs> no, when you don't actually, you know, the same you wouldn't like ignore science where it says, oh, temperatures are going to get hotter and we're going to have some serious issues due to that as, as a species. So I think climbing can teach us like a kind of objectivity and a, a sort of a humility in sort of needing, when we need to take action, we have to take action on a climb. And as, as a, as a a planet when we have to take action be better. That's one thing that that scaling from micro to macro. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I like right. that. Those little yeah. lessons that we get yeah. as climbers. And I think we can share those lessons with people and be like, hey, you know, we're in touch with this place and we you know, we're hearing from our scientists that something needs to change course. So and also just like I think the Access Fund does it really well, but really empowering all the climbers, especially younger or beginning climbers, to not be afraid to bring those things up or to ask those hard questions of each other or of the Access Fund or whoever, and just really encouraging people to think Are there any more questions from the audience? Anything from, from stewardship to mental training? Okay, wonderful. 
any closing remarks from the panelists? Okay. Just say thanks for coming, guys. Yeah. 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 Yeah.